Uh, Jay's got an announcement, so I'm going to call for an announcement. Hello, everybody. Um, hi. So, um, we're a couple of minutes late, so I'm going to get this going. Uh, let me just start by saying I've got prepared notes, so excuse me if I'm uh, stopping and starting here. Uh, let me start by saying uh, one thing before I even do anything else so I don't forget it. This microphone that I'm using is going to be uh, in the audience. We're recording this uh, this uh, this talk uh, as we do with all of these, and so we want to make sure that if you have a question and answers with Jay here that you're recorded. So to do that, if you have a question, please put your hand up, find the person with the mic, they'll be wandering around, and make sure that uh, that you speak into the mic when you ask your question, so we have you on record. And uh, even better, if you can say your name. Um, anyway, let me get started. Uh, hi, I'm Peter Norton. Welcome to the second NILA general meeting of 2012. Tonight we'll be hearing from Jay Emerson from Yale University about the statistical programming language R. Um, before we begin, I'd like to take a few minutes to share some announcements, and I'll get yours in a minute, Jay. Uh, other Jay. Um, and to thank and introduce the various people involved in making this event happen. First of all, tonight we are here in this space uh, at this meeting because a number of Googlers have agreed to take time out of their evening to open the doors here and host us in Google Spacious Facilities. And we want to give a great thank you to all of you. Um, I haven't met all of you, but I'm going to name the names that I have here. Um, Jorgen Balstein, I believe. By the way, excuse me if I uh, get your names wrong. Uh, only have to um, Jared Brothers, Jimmy Kaplowitz, Ed Marzak, Shankar Kumar, Patrick Donnellan, Eric Garrido, Peter uh, Ingraham, Dave, uh, Daniel Boyd, Gregory Martin, Avery Panaram, Ken Ware, uh, Hawaii Nguyen, and David Lamble, everyone, you know, they, we're here because of them. So uh, applause would be appreciated. <laughs> Sponsors. Uh, they are IBM, Canonical, the Brandor Group, and O'Reilly Media. And I'd also like to thank Nylog's volunteers uh, for all the hard work they do and have done over the years to keep the organization running and to keep events like this happening. Uh, we are the oldest uh, running continuous uh, Linux users group in New York City, and it is thanks to our volunteers that we are still operating today. Um, just to give you a quick rundown on who these people are. Tonight we have David Bristow and Rob Mendes uh, operating the camera and uh, doing the video. Um, our workshop team runs our workshop meetings every other week. They are Rob Mendes, uh, Jonas Arnado, David Bristow, and Hannah Eisenman. Um, our mailing list administration team is Greg Levin and Chris Nadel. Um, our server admin team is Aaron Grogan and Chris Nadel. And our meeting organization team is Danny Rathjens, Mark Russell, and Brian Cooper. Our web team is Stephanie Schulting, Jeremy Donson, Fernando Orocus, Scott uh, Wolfog, and uh, Javaron Turkey. And again, excuse me if I get these names wrong. Some of these people I haven't had a chance to meet in person. Um, our numerous contributors, past and present, also deserve a mention. These are especially uh, noteworthy are Jim Gleason, Ron Guerin, Tony Marchesano, Larry Duchovny, Sonny Dubay, and Brian Gupta. Tonight, if you need anything and have any questions, feel free to grab, uh, especially if you know any of us, just grab the person you know, but otherwise, uh, myself, Peter Norton, Brian Gupta, uh, who you'll be hearing from in a moment uh, about future meetings. Um, Sonny Dubay, Sonny, you are over there in the back as well. Um, Danny Ratchins, over here by the door, or Aaron Grogan, who'll be in a little later, so uh, maybe that wasn't the right time for that. Um, anyway. Uh, does anyone in the audience, before we continue, have any announcements that they would like to make? Okay, Jay, do you want to step on, do you want to step on the mic? No, it's okay. Uh, come on. This is for posterity. <laughs> High posterity. Um, okay, uh, let's see. I'm sorry. There are two upcoming meetings of LISP NYC. One of them is on St. Valentine's Day. So there'll be a lot. Um, there may not be as many people as usual. Um, the next one, I think I will speak. And because of the remarkably 
functorial foundations of the R programming system, I may use it to demonstrate the difference between classical probability and quantum probability. And most important, there's a deadline of 5 p.m. New York time tomorrow for signing Bunny Huang's petition to the Register of Copyrights. This petition is in service of keeping the right to own a computer. Um, look up Bunny Huang, um, jailbreaking isn't a crime, and of course you can also send in your own comments. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. Anyone else have any announcements? Okay. Um, so, uh, on to annihilating announcements. So, um, I'd like to let you know about our upcoming meetings and uh, talks for the rest of the year. Um, this month, we have three additional meetings. Uh, some of you are aware that we've been work working on incorporation. Uh, I'm happy to report that Nylog is now officially a New York State not-for-profit and has been for just a little bit over a month, I think. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do, namely the uh, current work around resolving our charter and um, drafting and sorry, excuse me, and uh, you know, getting that drafted uh, and uh, ready so that we actually have the rules down for what the group, uh, how it will be run. Um, on Tuesday, February 21st, we will be having our fourth meeting regarding the charter. Anyone who wants to participate, please look at the uh, homepage of the mailing list for more information. It'll be at the Hudson Park branch of the New York Public Library, and if you're interested in learning more, etc., uh, please join us. Um, in addition, the next actual workshop, put this hand. The next actual workshop uh, will be on Tuesday, February 28th. Is that right? That sounds good. Cool. Sorry, I got these uh, confused here. It will February be February 14th. 14th. Is that right? February 14th. 14th? Yes. Yes, 14th and then the 28th. Um, for the remainder of this year, we have some very interesting talks coming up. Uh, Brian's been working on lining these up. And uh, yeah, I'll let him give you a preview. Uh, Brian, can you take a moment? Brian, go up to everyone. Jay's talk, we'll be raffling off a copy of um, this book here, The Art of R Programming, and the back matter is, the back matter says, R is the world's most popular language for developing statistical software. Archaeologists use it to track the spread of ancient civilizations, drug companies use it to discover which medications are safe and effective, and actuaries use it to assess financial risks and keep markets running smoothly. And, um, so this book will be available. We're going to ask our presenter to come up with some quiz questions to uh, sort of 
maybe rafting is the wrong word, but to uh, award it to someone who wants to answer those questions. They can be on topic or off topic, whatever you're feeling like. Uh, that's up to you. <coughs> Just make it fair. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, what's my birthday with your, you know. All right. So um, our website team is hard at work. They're working on the relaunch of the Nylog job site and uh, redesigning our main website. Uh, as we go live, we will have opportunities for additional volunteers to uh, help making content. So, uh, if that's something you're interested in, uh, you know, keep watching this space. Um, speaking of future meetings, and uh, specifically the turnout tonight, and at the last meeting, we are very pleased by the turnout here, and we're really impressed with the number of people and, and the interest we managed to generate. Um, you know, based on, on the clear positive results uh, that we've gotten from it, we are going to continue to announce our meetings on meetup.com, in addition to announcing them on the mailing list on the webpage. Um, and the last of these is that the workshop team is interested in hosting formal Linux beginner talks. If you're interested in giving such a talk, or just want to know more about them, uh, please contact them. We can point out both uh, David and Rob to you if you're interested. Um, on another topic, uh, in the future we may need to institute a real name policy uh, for meeting RSVPs. This means that you may be asked to RSVP for a talks with a full name that matches the government issued ID. I don't know how specific this is going to get, but you know, the general thing you get into a building. Um, anyway, you need to bring that ID to get in. We want to make sure that this change doesn't take anyone by surprise. In the past we've tried very hard to find places that don't have such requirements. Um, I don't think it's a big deal, but it, it's the way the world works, and unfortunately, we, we have to go along with it. Um, tonight, after this meeting, Aaron Brogan and Sonny Dubé will be leading us to a local drinking establishment. Uh, we're going to continue a long-standing dialogue tradition, which is a Stammtisch, and this is a German uh, word for this tradition, which means it's a regular table, which uh, will be your opportunity to talk to other people at this, who uh, are attended tonight, other people who are interested in these topics. And uh, I believe Jay, our speaker, will be uh, joining us. And so, that's the end of the announcements. Let me talk about our presenter. I'd like you. I'd like to introduce you to Jay Emerson uh, from Yale University. Um, now, when I read this in my email, I realized that uh, I realized that Jay's bio is a bit intimidating. So uh, check this out. Uh, he's a man who used to write his own video games in Basic on a deck rainbow in the mid '80s. Uh, anyone? Any hands? Anyone else? See? Okay. Um, he did a little assembly language programming on a Mac Classic. He built a PC from scratch in the late 90s and installed Debian. Uh, getting a little more esoteric, he hacked an early Spark printer driver for use with a newer version of Solaris at the time. If you still have one of these, you can find more info on Jay's page at stat.yale.edu. In a previous life, that is a pre-PhD, probably when he, he had a lot less time, however, he worked as a Unix and Windows system administration, uh, systems administrator for a few years, uh, though he declares that the Windows work was under protest. Is that right? Okay. And uh, he loves Perl and uses it regularly, but finds actually that he rarely needs to use it uh, because R does so much of what he needs. Um, he loves to travel, cook, eat, and drink, and he just returned from the World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, he loves to teach, and for anyone who may be interested following this presentation, he is willing and able to give a wide range of workshops on statistics, data analysis, and R. Um, and to finish on a Linux-related note, he uses Ubuntu currently and thinks that Unity sucks, so you guys can talk about that afterwards. <laughs> and uh, I hope you enjoy his talk on R. Everybody, please give it up for Jay Emerson. And <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Not so good. Meaning which? Is that better? A little yeah. better? Okay. Um, so I just needed something as a filler here. We have a talk coming up on classical versus quantum physics. Maybe that would be the physics counterpart of classical versus Bayesian statistics. Uh, I gave a talk on that last fall and uh, I'm a little bit more involved on the theoretical side than what we're dealing with tonight. Um, but I, I hope that this is an informal talk. I hope that you'll feel free to stop me and ask questions. Um, I'll feel free to cut you off and plow on if I think we're getting off on too much of a tangent. But let's just play it by ear and see how it goes. Um, I have a core set of material with a couple of examples that I really hope I can get through in sort of 30 to 40 minutes, maybe. 
and then I have even more material later on that can go off in one of two directions depending on people's interests and their tolerance for listening to me for more than about 45 minutes. <laughs> so when I've done meetups before um, in New York, I generally find that for people who've been working all day doing whatever you're doing, 8 o'clock is usually a pretty good stopping point. And if you need to get up and leave, just do it. You won't offend me. Go home. You might have kids to put to bed. That's fine. I'll stay here if there's people who are willing to you know, continue to listen. And if we wind up at the pub in 45 minutes, that's OK, too. So. I'm going to plow ahead. I may get up and down here a little bit. But uh, in the background, you actually have a picture of two men really responsible for the R language. We have Robert Gentleman on the left and Ross Ahaka on the right. Ross was actually on the faculty at Yale uh, for a couple of years and spent a huge amount of time in my office in the basement of the Sets Department um, writing code. And no one really knew what he was doing. Uh, so the world is a different place now. We have some idea what he was doing. Uh, although I'm sure that Ross and Robert both did write a lot of code for the R project. I think that really their greatest contribution to the project was their willingness to turn it open so early. They weren't sitting there saying, well, this is our little project and we're going to maintain control. At a fairly early point, they basically threw it open and brought in a group of collaborators to, to help with the effort. And I think that it was that decision to go open so early in the process that really led to its success. And I think that we're seeing that now. If we look at the wealth of resources available for the R language, um, it's because there's a community that started growing early on and was inclusive rather than just being a project of two guys who thought they could re-implement the S language. So I'll say a little bit more about some of that. But uh, given that I had their pictures up there, I thought I should start with that. Really, John Chambers, uh, back at AT&T uh, with a couple of collaborators, I'll, I'll mention everyone later, really started the ball rolling with the S language. Um, the S language started out, eventually evolved into sort of S and S plus. It was purchased by Insightful and then maybe someone else. Um, maybe Tibco has it now. So the, the, the S language still exists, um, but it actually exists in R. R is really an open source implementation of the S language. And with some qualifications, there are of course, some things that don't work equally well in R and S+, but for the most part, if you have S code, it'll work in R and vice versa. Um, yes, there's exceptions, but I really like to talk about R as an open source implementation of the S language. And I don't really know how much longer S+, is going gonna, gonna to hang out. I don't know if they're actually selling new licenses for S+, or if it's just legacy licenses. I'm not sure. Everyone seems to be moving to R. Um, so John started the ball rolling, but R is really a programming environment. It's a high-level programming language. It's not um, point and click and use menus. Um, that's fine. Pointing and clicking and using menus has a place, maybe, for some people. But I have a feeling that tonight here, most of you might be more sympathetic than a lot of audiences on that front. Not maybe so shy about writing a little bit of code. Um, just an instant. So it really is a programming language, and it's not just for doing statistics. It really is a high-level programming environment that has a huge wealth of, of resources for doing statistics and data analysis and graphical exploration. And that's great, but you can actually make use of R and I think have, have fun and be productive using R, even if you have no interest at all in statistics per se. So maybe I'll demonstrate that more or less by example. There's no way I can prove this, but maybe I can convince you to, to possibly give it a try. The price is right, so there's not much of a downside. So uh, I'm just pulling material here. This is copied straight out of you know one of the classic introductions to R. Venable Smith and the R Development Core team published this. You can download the introduction to R for free on the R Project site. This is in the introduction. Uh, it's a good place to start. We have a book here that you can go out and buy. Um, and that's fine. You might also win it later. But why not start with material that's free? A lot of time and effort has gone into preparing this. Um, so there's maybe nothing here that explicitly says too much about statistics up top anyway. You want to be able to handle data, store it in some way. That seems sensible. You want to be able to do things that are mathy. Uh, there might be some tools for, you lost me. I lost you. There might be some tools for data analysis. Uh, Graphics. Lost it again, huh? Testing? No. Nope. 
So I can go into lecture voice. <laughs> I'll leave it on. If it pops back on, that's fine. If not, we'll be okay too. Oh, really? Okay. Between one of the two. Nope. Between one of the two, maybe we'll be okay here. Uh, but it really is a programming language, and I, I want you to see it as general like that, not for something that just is for doing statistics. It has a lot of features that you would expect of a programming language, maybe some that you didn't expect, but maybe you'll find eventually just to be wildly um, convenient. So, um, again, the term environment here is, is really the, the key. It is a big system. It's not just for doing statistics. Um, it has some things that it can do as well, or maybe even better than Perl, depending on your talents using Perl. The code is certainly far more readable than Perl, and I say that based on years of experience writing miserable Perl code. Uh, so I, I really hope that you see R here as a general tool for doing research and development, not necessarily for something that's just designed to do certain types of statistical analysis. So. Uh, really, R is where the, the field of statistics is going. Um, I'm not saying that people don't do statistics without using R. There's popular languages out there that a lot of people are very happy with, but people new doing new statistical methodology are implementing it almost without exception in the R language. They're not sitting around thinking that the first thing they have to do is implement this new technique for SAS. SAS is great. I have friends who work at SAS, and we have drinks after talks like this. <laughs> I'll leave it at that, but um, it, um, it really is the direction that the field of statistics is moving and other fields are coming along for the ride. Even if they're not spending most of their time doing statistics, I think that they're seeing the advantages of some of this. Uh, the bottom point maybe is worth emphasizing. Um, I don't mind coding in C. I'd rather not code in C++. I'm not particularly good at it. I see the advantages of being able to do that, but I don't think that developing new tools in C or C++ is the right way to go. If you're doing research and development, you want to be able to do something quickly. Put together a pilot version of something, test it out, does this make sense? Do a little bit of back testing if you're doing finance, whatever. But you want to do something quickly. Try out your ideas in an environment that's friendly and lets you decide whether or not you actually have something worthwhile. Then at some point in time, if you do have something worthwhile, yeah, so Pass it off to programmers who can handle it, or maybe if you're good enough, you can handle it yourself. But I think that you want to do the research and development in an environment like R first and foremost, and then maybe even interface between R and some of these other languages for doing a professional version. And R has a lot of facilities for doing things that you might expect, integrating with other languages in particular. And I might finish off later tonight by talking a little bit about the C and C++ interface. So that was really intended just as an introduction. I'm not going to say too much here about the other software packages. Uh, don't use statistics in Excel, please. Um, I think they've fixed some bugs, but it really isn't the place to be. SAS is an amazing, amazing toolkit, I suppose. Um, I don't see it as particularly flexible. I don't see it as a programming environment that I'd be happy working in. Um, but really, SAS is terrific if you can afford it and if you're doing certain things. SPSS, Stata, um, Minitab, maybe you've heard of some of these. Nice packages for doing core statistics, but again, I don't think that for the most part they have the flexibility of a programming environment um, in the sense that I think a lot of us here tonight would, uh, would, would view that term. MATLAB, perhaps, perhaps, is the best comparison. It really is um, a high-level programming language. I think it shares a lot of the characteristics of, of R. Yes? Octave is Yeah, okay, I should have put that up there as well. I'm going to make a push for uh, open source projects. Octave is the open source version of MATLAB. Um, I'm not actually aware of how well it manages to reproduce a lot of MATLAB's capabilities. I do know that there's some sort of community involved. I'm not actually aware of whether it's an even larger community than the R community. Would you like to come? It's pretty good. It's pretty good, okay. So, again topic to cover over, over during sites. Um, but MATLAB has really the same sort of syntax that R does. I think though that R has uh, just a suite of tools for doing various types of statistical analyses that MATLAB and Octave can't match. But you know what? I think that for a lot of things that you might want to do, you probably can do it in MATLAB or Octave as well. So I can't really say a whole lot more on that um, other than 
I really do like having open source software and being able to get under the hood and see what's going on. And I'm not really sure how much of that happens with MATLAB. Obviously, it works with, with Envoy. Any other comments like that before I plow into maybe example one? What about Python? Almost. Python? Python? I mean, I haven't used it. I'm aware of it. Um, it might have been a better choice than Perl at some point in the past. Uh, doesn't Python have some funny requirement that you space over a certain number of times to... <laughs> 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 so, so, nice thing about Python is that there are bindings to R. Well, then okay. you can, can you repeat the question or the comments? It's I'm sorry, the questions and comments have to do with how fabulous Python is and why are we having this talk at all? <laughs> <laughs> So there are bindings for Python and R? You can use R from Python. You can use R from Python. <laughs> um, I think SAS is claiming that you can use R from SAS. I, I don't mean to say that you can't. I suspect that they are right, and you can. If that appeals to you, that's wonderful. Other points on languages that are less obscure than R? <laughs> Gauss. I use Gauss long time ago, once, for a project. Um, actually, fairly similar, I think, in terms of the syntax to MATLAB and R. I, I don't think that it's anywhere near as widely used anymore as MATLAB and R. Although, if you're in economics, you might have a wide set of colleagues who are dedicated to Ghost. Same idea. Yep. Fundamentally, matrix-based languages. Yep. Others I've missed? Uh, way out there, but log church. Never heard of it. Sorry. Face it. <laughs> log church. Log. Log and church are two uh, programming languages uh, for uh, the Bayesian end of things. Okay. I am a fan of the Bayesian end of things, but I can't say if uh, I've run into this. Others I've neglected? Uh, PSPP. PSPP. Is it S open source SPSS? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> are you using Medimedica? I've used Mathematica. Mathematica, yeah. That's, mm. <laughs> Isn't that far more mathematical and less having to do with data analysis and statistics, though? I think if we're at least trying to say that, stay on the statistics side of things. Um, mathematicians, fabulously uh, useful tool. Statistics, <laughs> not sure. I, I wouldn't suspect so. What about eViews? Eviews. Yeah. Uh, Four out of five applicants for our master's program uh, claimed he have used eViews previously, so it must be impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I have a PhD and I use it, so there you go. <laughs> I can't say I'm familiar with it at all, I'm sorry. Yeah. But I have heard of it. Yeah. yeah. It's not necessarily another language, but I, I just wondered how, how are the scalability? Like public planning environment, can you really run R? So the question had something to do with the scalability of R and multi-platform environments. I'm going to table that one, and maybe I'll get there at the end. Uh, I do have a little bit of material I can talk about having to do with parallel programming with R uh, in a very flexible way, both on you know multi-core machine or on a cluster setup. Uh, there's really some fabulous tools there. If you're really interested, I can talk about memory management, handling massive data sets using shared memory, various tricks that we've been able to do using the Boost Interprocess Library. I'm hoping that actually we won't get there, but <laughs> we can talk about it later if we don't. Yeah. Others? Okay. Finally, some code. Well, almost code. So getting and installing R, I guess back here I didn't comment, but uh, obviously there's versions that you can uh, download for Windows <coughs> and Mac. Uh, and Revolution Analytics and R Studio both produce versions of R. Uh, you can actually download them for free. They're not charging for them unless you feel that you need to pay money. I think they'll probably accept it. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure what the business models are. Uh, I have some ideas, but I don't really need to talk about that too much. They're basically R with some add-ons. For RStudio, it's actually a pretty nice GUI, if you happen to like GUIs. Uh, for Revolution Analytics, I know they were working on a GUI. They do have um, a library for some big data handling. There was a question about scalability earlier. And for a certain set of things, it does it fabulously well. Um, I don't know how extensible it is. Yes? 
resolution have a GUI, and their model is they have an enterprise version that's really expensive. Okay, so the, the comment was that Revolution actually does have a GUI, and they have an enterprise version that is fabulously expensive. Okay. <laughs> yes? Uh, does R plug into Eclipse? I can't hear you at all. Does, so we're does R on. plug into Eclipse? Does R plug into Eclipse? Eclipse. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Haven't done it. Does anyone know the answer to that question? Does R plug into Eclipse? Yes, it does. This is going to be an open source talk tonight. <laughs> okay, so for people like you, uh, maybe you can actually download and install R by using um, Debian or Ubuntu versions that are distributed, but I'd encourage you to actually download the source code and use something um, you know, old fashioned like configure, make and make install. The make install is optional depending on whether you actually want the thingy to go someplace. And a lot of you, I think, know this, so I don't want to go into too much uh, detail. But after having done that, you just fire up R by typing R and see <laughs> something like this. So my version's a little bit out of date, but this is the lengthy welcome screen where all the way down to the bottom, none of you can see it, there's a little greater than sign. That greater than sign is the prompt. And at this point, R is just waiting for you to do something. And so I'm going to try to jump out of this and see if I can actually do this. Type R, and yep, we get the same screen. Down at the bottom is, is a greater than sign. And so at this point in time, really, you can just treat R like a calculator. You can type something that you're interested in. It'll come back, hopefully, with the you correct answer. Windows. You can assign that to something. Could you move the window a little bit to could the you, right? Could you move it to the right? Yes, thank you. Right. Better? Yes. Yeah, good. OK, so there's objects. And you know, I'm actually not going to go through and give a comprehensive description of various data structures. You'll actually see most of the core data structures in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, but it's sitting there waiting for you to do stuff. So the greater than sign is the prompt. At this point, that's about all that we need to know. So after you've installed R, the question is, well, what do you actually want to do? And so um, before we even do that, there's maybe an even better question. What really am I going to do? So I alluded to the fact that I would give you a couple of examples, but um, really my hope is to just try to demonstrate that I think R is very exciting, and I think that there's good reasons why you might want to at least consider it. Maybe you have a suite of tools that are just ideal for what you're doing, and that's, that's wonderful. But I think that R is a very good alternative for certain reasons. And uh, don't think that I'm giving you a couple of examples that um, only have to do with, say, gambling on college basketball. I'll talk about gambling on college basketball. <laughs> the talk is not about gambling on college basketball. It's about doing interactive data analysis on some real-world problem. Um, there's other site types of things that you might be interested in, like developing tools and being able to distribute tools so they can be used by thousands of people. That's a very different sort of problem from studying gambling on college basketball, right? One's sort of a one-off interactive data exploration problem. The other one's really about development and dissemination of, of tools for a wider audience. Um, they seem very different, but actually there's some connections here, and I'll try to give you a little bit of, of each tonight. So I'm going to start by uh, doing something that maybe most Linux people are familiar with, and that is, well, try to take a look at some information in some web server logs. And so I'm actually going to zip out of the talk here. And at this point, this microphone isn't on, so I'm going to be sort of multitasking here with the microphone. OK, scrape access log. By the way, I should say, these are all up on the web, right there. I'll try to remember to shift stuff to the right if I can. Uh, my home page up at Yale, www.stat.yale.edu slash tilde j, that's a little bit small, slash l-u-g, capital letters. Um, most of the materials for the course are here. I guess at this point I'll just take a couple minutes and say that in particular, the overheads that you're looking at I'm producing using Beamer. Inside Beamer there's actually embedded R code. It's using a package that comes with the R distribution, it's called sweave that allows you to pre-process your LaTeX document or your Beamer document, actually run in the R code that it finds embedded in the document, it takes care of graphical issues that need to be taken care of so those graphics can be integrated directly into the presentation. 
after you pre-process it, you run PDF LaTeX or whatever your, your favorite choice is. So I'm actually giving you the source code for the overhead. It's that RNW file. If you look at that, it's Beamer with some R code embedded and a couple of tricks. But you can actually pre-process that with R and produce the uh, slides for this talk on your own once you have everything installed. I have a couple of scripts that we're going to look at, and they're all up there. Um, I have a few graphics that went into this talk, just so you can actually process the thing. And then there's a parallel site with some of the more advanced material later on. But I hope that some of these materials will be helpful. So we're going to start right here with the weblog processing. And it's awfully nice to have two screens so you can go back and forth. But I think we'll try to make do with this. So R has a command called scan. At this point, I'm actually scanning from a local copy of the file, but scan actually can go out and grab things out on the web from a URL. Very flexible for sucking data sets into R from the web. Scan is just going to read this in. I'm saying the thing that I'm reading in is text base. What equals quote quote? Sort of a lazy way to accomplish that. I'm going to separate the records just using an end of line character. And then I'm going to take a look at the first record, and I'm going to ask R, what's the length of this object that I'm about to work with? So let's see, back over here, I guess I need to be in R. I'm going to do this with one hand. What equals quote quote? Yeah, so right here, it's just saying that the stuff I'm about to read in is character based. So the alternative would be. That would be what equals. You know, I don't use scan with that. If I know it's numeric, I usually pull it in a different way. Um, this is the sort of thing where we get in the habit of doing the same thing over and over because it's fabulously useful. Um, if I have a data set that looks like an Excel spreadsheet, I don't use scan. I use something like read CSV that you'll see later on. Um, but if I'm pulling something in that's unprocessed data, I almost always want to treat it just as a big, long vector of text data that I can then process and use to construct a data set. So, try to get this up higher. The first item looks like uh, something that you might see in a typical web log. It looks like someone made it a hit on the stat department server from that, that IP address. We have a date stamp and then some other stuff. So x bracket, one bracket, unsurprisingly, gives you the first element of the vector. So x is a vector of character, uh, character strings. The total length of this particular log, I don't know if it was a month or what, it just happened to be over 100,000 records. So it sucked that in without too much trouble. Um, really. If you like Perl and Python, you might say, oh, I could have read that in in half the time. <laughs> and you're probably right. What can I say? Uh, what we're about to do, though, I bet I can do faster than you can do, at least if we're talking about speed of code development. Now, if you're really interested in speed of execution, um, I have written some fabulous C code to do some data parsing. And then my advisor said, you know, you should try to use Perl. And so I wrote Perl to do exactly the same job. The code was you know, a fifth as long, and it ran about 20 times faster than my C code. That tells you something about my C code. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, if you can develop code more quickly, it doesn't really matter if the speed differential is a factor of two. And when you're talking about hiccups to do this, it doesn't really matter. So now I have this thing, and this is a typical record. What I'd like to do here is just quickly go through a little interactive data exploration based on the desire to understand the time of day that people are visiting the stat department website. So that's based purely on this time and date stamp right here. I basically want to be able to unpack that in a way that I can do a little bit of data analysis. So I'm going to use regular expressions that are built into R and actually vectorized. I don't need to write any loops. So I'm going to say, well, first of all, I need to move my thing over to the right. Is that better? Keep reminding me if I forget. So I'm going to figure out the starting and ending expression, starting and ending position of the open bracket and close bracket. It happens to be called R-E-G-E-X-P-R for regular expression. And if it hits a match, it gives you the character position of the first hit. If there's no match, I think it returns a negative 1, something like that. But it's going to go through this entire vector of length 137,000 and give me the starting position and the ending position of the brackets that surround the um, date and time stamp. And so I'm going to do that and then actually peek at some of the results to see if I trust it. You basically shouldn't trust anything. Chances are it's wrong the first time you try it. 
So in this first uh, element of the vector that we were looking at, it claims that the open bracket start is in uh, position 21, and this closed bracket is in position 48. That seems about right. Now, we've just looked at the first one, but it actually did that for the entire vector of length 137,000. We have all those to work with at this point. And so let's actually take a look at uh, what we have for each of those, not just the start position and the end position, but there's a table of where the start positions occur. So at the very top, we have a 9 and a 62 directly below it. That means that 62 times the starting position, the open square bracket, uh, was in position 9 of the character string. And five times the open square bracket was in position 14. So there's some records here that, that are a little bit unusual. You can see most of the business is where the first open square bracket is near position uh, 18 and 19 and 20. So that actually seems pretty reasonable if you're used to looking at web logs. You also have the uh, ending position. And then what's even more interesting is that if you subtract, now this is a big, long vector operation. I have 137 start positions, 137,000 ending positions. Subtract the beginning position from the ending position. You get 27. That means that that date and timestamp is consistently a fixed length. No variability at all. That's pretty nice. That makes you feel that you've actually done something probably right. Very convenient. You look puzzled. What are you wondering? I was as surprised as you are, I assure you. <laughs> What is the nature of the start and end objects? Um, what, what do you mean by that question? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I type like, start in honor, to have it show me what it looks like, give me a bunch of ones, and it says DTTR use lights. And I'm not familiar with what that is. This one? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure where you're seeing, seeing so it. You, you I'm happy to type start. Yep. Okay, so there's mine. It's cut it off. It apparently only one to show the first 100,000. Yeah. Yeah, so right. What are all those ones? Hmm. Good question. So what's the type here? Let's just do a little query. STR, maybe. Uh, start. STR is short for structure. Maybe it'll tell us something useful here. So this thing is atomic. Can't say I've seen that before. Um, so it looks like the actual um, the actual data values 21, 19, 19, 19. Those look real. Um, it has attributes. Match length. Hmm. Well, maybe there was exactly one match. No, no. I got it. <laughs> one because it's the length of the original. Yeah, right. It's one because it's one character. It's so one character. Oh, it could be. It could be that it's giving us more than just the starting position. It might be giving us the length of the thing that was matched. That seems useless. Or maybe the number of things that were matched. Yeah, the number of open brackets you found in the string in each string. I'm not so sure about that. But yeah, this is really a meta comment. Last time I looked at the documentation for. It was catastrophically bad with respect to, oh no, only one thing. It's got great documentation. It's a great system. I've used it from, I don't know how many years. First time it was usable, I used it. Um, it's almost, I, I have yet to find, I gave up looking uh, about two years ago. But, I, but um, what is a table? What the hell is it? What kind of object is it? If you, if you know C or list or Python, or Ruby, or any of it. You know what, or have taken a course in the lower predicate calculus, you know what a struct is. So you want to know, when you read the documentation, tell me, write it out in some notation, give me a page so I can understand it, as to what a table is. Now, you're a better man or woman than I am if you can figure it out. So you made two comments. One was saying something about, uh, that was inaccurate, wasn't it? You actually made many more than two comments. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's a meta thing. Like, what the hell is a, what the hell is a table? You 
made a comment that led me to believe you were going to complain about the quality of documentation. <laughs> documentation is great. I was about to agree with you. Except for types. You continued on to say how no, no. <laughs> documentation <laughs> is great, except that the types, the major type, it one of the major types, is utterly yeah. incomprehensible. It, could, it could you refresh the screen? Could you refresh the screen? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to move on. Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have been able to use REG EXPR for years, basically only for this purpose. And obviously, there's a lot more information right. here than I have made right. use of previously. So there's a side step for you. Having done this, let's go ahead and see what we can do. There's a substring command, again, entirely vectorized, that says, OK, Go through and pull apart substring starting at position given by start, ending at position given by end. And it's just going to go through, no need for a loop. We can look at, um, first of all, both the original one, and then we can check to see that the thing that we pulled apart is, in fact, that uh, date stamp. So far, so good. So we've moved on from x, which is the raw vector, to y, which is the partly processed vector. At this point, now you're starting to see some of the um, various data structures that are available. We can take that vector of character y, and we can split it up. Think split in Perl, if that's your thing. Split apart this string, this string based on the colon. And the result is actually going to be a list. And you can access elements of the list in various ways. I'm just giving you two ways here that are slightly different. So trust me, the temp is a big long list of results. Um, the length of the list is the same 137 odd thousand. Right? We're looking now at the first element of the list two different ways. If you use a single bracket with a list, the convention is that it's actually giving you a sublist. It's still of type list. If you use the double bracket, then it's actually giving you the contents of a certain position in the list. Subtle difference, it looks like it's the same, but it's sort of a gotcha if you're playing around with lists for the first time. But you can see that what it's actually done is taken that date timestamp, separated it into components based on the, uh, the colon character. So now we can take that. I'm actually not remotely interested in the date. I just want to take a look at the time of day. And you can see that uh, the time of day is going to be particularly easy to access. It looks like here we have a 4 and a 27. And the rest of it's just junk. I'm going to disregard the seconds, for example. So um, having done that, there's a lot here. S apply. Wait, can I just ask, so is sure. that returning a list of vectors? Is each one, is, what, what, is, what is in each list? It is a list of vectors, and I'll answer that question by talking about this. S apply takes, uh, in this case, it's taking a list. And it uses a function that you provide it, and applies that function to every element of the list. So this internal command, the s apply part of this command, is saying, take this big long list, look at every component of the list, and tell me what the length is. The result of that is a vector of 137 odd thousand. And each thing that's returned is the length of the, the particular component of the list. So yes, it's a list of vectors. In particular, we've just learned here that it's a list of vectors of length 4. So these date timestamps are fabulously dependable. We'll see examples where this isn't the case in a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, just balancing off this question uh, that was asked a second ago, what would be the output if you enter that command without uh, without wrapping it in the table function? What would S apply temp? S apply would return 137,966 ports. OK. OK, thanks. Yeah. But so when you compact into a table, yeah. I mean, what? So this table is actually, I'll, I'll make a, this is really dangerous given I think this guy asked the question. Um, I believe that this is a vector of length one containing the number 137,966 and then having a names attribute uh, that is the number four. Uh, and I'm going to move uh, on before he checks uh, me on that. <laughs> no, no. It, it, it's, it's incomprehensible, but one must enter into R. Okay. <laughs> Let's try this. Think about what I have now. I have this um, list structure. Every component of the list is dependable <laughs> length 4, and I need that right now. If I did not have that, I couldn't do what I'm about to do. The first thing I'm doing is taking that list, and I'm saying, I don't want it to be a list. I'd actually like it to be a vector. There's a command called unlist that is happy to do that for you. 
So onList takes this big long list, it turns it into a huge long vector of length 4 times 137 on 1,000. And then I'm going to drop those values into a matrix structure, and I'm going to insist that there be four columns. And furthermore, that I want to fill up this matrix row by row. So you can imagine what's happening. Each element of the list has four components, right? So I'm just, just going to drop those into this matrix structure one by one, filling up the rows. So now every row of this matrix contains the things that I split apart from these original date timestamps. And so now we actually have a dimension here to this thing. One-handed typing is pretty efficient. 137,000 odd by four. And we can look, say, at the beginning of it. That's kind of nice. Head, by default, gives you the first six elements of whatever you're looking at. And so you can now see that we actually have this date timestamp unpacked now in a matrix of character. And from this, it'll be much easier to start doing our data analysis. So we can look at the beginning of it. We can also do tables, say, of the columns. So we hope that we have hours and minutes, and it actually looks like that's reasonable. Hours go from 0 to 23. Minutes go from 0 to 59. Okay. Now at this point, I can just do a little bit of math. And instead of keeping hours and minutes separately, I can have the hour of each individual hit by adding on the fractional part having to do with the minutes. I have to say, as numeric, because we're starting out with character-based things, and we want to make sure those are numbers before we try to do math, that seems sensible. And then we might want to plot. And R is fabulous at doing plots, and I'm just going to give you four plots of pretty much the same thing. So there we go. So three histograms. One on the top left is the default bin width. That's often OK, but sometimes you want to play with that, maybe create more bins or a whole lot more bins down on the left. Or consider a smooth version of the histogram. It's called a kernel density plot. So these are standard plots, quick and easy to produce with basically a line or two of code plus some options. Nothing more. But you can see that you know, I'm doing too much talking and I'm not doing enough typing. So it seems like slow interactive data exploration. But this very quickly becomes a very efficient process where you feel like you're having a conversation with the data set. You really feel like you're engaging the data set. You're not writing code and then compiling it, and then running it, and then checking what you got, and then going back and revising the code and in a slow process. This is a much faster interactive process that you can have with your data set. Good. So I think that's probably the end of that little example, although I have something else down here. Yes, what do I expect you to remember when I give a quiz at the end? No. So R <laughs> does have vectorized regular expressions. You've actually seen most of the core data structures here. We've had vectors, we've had lists, I used matrices, and you haven't seen data frames yet. Actually. But we'll see data frames Actual. in just a minute. But you're shaking your finger at That's the one. That's, That's the one that's in common. Question in the back. Yeah. What's, sorry, what's the difference between a vector and a list? <laughs> the difference between a vector and a list? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the elements of a vector need to be um, need to be an accepted data structure that has fixed length. It can't have ragged length, whereas lists can actually have completely arbitrary elements. That's, that's close. It may not be exactly right there, but I don't think this is something that's specific to R. Isn't this more of a general data structures question? Well, it depends. It, it, the terms get a little flaky. You know, can we change a little from Java to C++ from this data structure's textbook to that data structure's textbook? So right. OK, so we agree that there's some flakiness with the, the vocabulary here. Do you want to? Yeah, I had the same question. I was wondering if the nomenclature might be the same one as scheme. I don't know anything about scheme. I'm sorry. OK, so scheme, the, the vector, the one that uh, is pre-allocated and double the allocation each time you Fill the allocated space, and the list is the one that's fast add at the front and slow forward. Ooh, now we're getting into the details of how things are implemented. And that's actually the sort of thing where the internals of R have changed to be more or less efficient on various things over the years. There's copy on write behavior, there's lazy evaluation, there's extra copies of objects that are created on the fly in R for some very good reasons in many cases, and some not so good reasons in other cases. Um, we can go into the details of the implementation, um, but that's probably not where we should be going now. 
Yes. But, but, okay, so I think that the data structures of R is one of the most confusing aspects of it, but I think I understand that, I could be wrong, but lists are typically um, key value pairs as well, right? And if you don't assign keys because they're kind of optional, then you can index it with integers. Instead. Yeah, you, you can index lists with integers or with names attributes. Yeah, but the same is true with vectors. Oh, okay, vectors still have names. You can have names attributes to vectors. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I need to move on to the second example here, I think. I'm going to try to sit back here, presentation mode. I'm actually not sure if, oh, oh no. You know what, I'm going to skip this detour because I have a feeling I'm, off, I'm way behind where I hope to be. Even our project.org is really where you need to be. You can download the source code. You can download pre-compiled binaries for the various platforms. They actually have free documentation that tends to be pretty good. If you're into the installation and administration manual, if you're interested in building packages, there's an entire segment of the documentation talking about building packages for R and the C and C++ interface. Maybe I'll talk about that a little bit later. CRAN is technically a separate area, although a lot of people think it's one and the same. Um, CRAN is actually the package repository, essentially, and there's on the order of about 3,000 packages for the R community available now on mirrors all around the world. And really, um, Ross and Robert's decision to go open source early on and the group's decision to put up this package repository called CRAN really um, explains, I think, a lot of the success of R. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, I will use some packages later on in the presentation. You can download them directly, no problem. Yeah? Yeah, so the question is, I mean, with 3,000 packages, is there some way to distinguish? I mean, what is the quality? What no. is the one that is good and what is crap? I, I, I think that actually yeah. a lot of them probably are not good. Mm -hmm. Or a lot of them were created by well-intentioned graduate students who decided they wanted to make a package explaining whatever they were doing. They probably tend to be fairly small for the most part, would not include compiled code. Um, there's others that are so widely used that they actually are then distributed with the core R uh, distribution. It can be all over the place and very difficult to tell, um, such as life. I think that there have been some efforts. But the ones with the R distribution, it tends to be good. Um, if it, are if a package is included with the R distribution, the quality, I'd say, is among the highest of any of the packages. Yeah. Can I speak to that just briefly? Our, sure. our, uh, CRAN does organize packages into something called... CRAN does organize packages into something called task views. So if there's something you want to do, almost, you know, a large number of related packages will be described in that task view. And if you just go searching on, on you know, Google or RSeq or some of like the R mailing list and are looking for a particular uh, function, uh, the same R packages will just pop to the top pretty quickly. So you'll get a good handle on quality, I think, just searching like that. You can also generally just take a look at the, the, the various version uploads for the package. If the package has been up, upgraded every couple of months for years, chances are someone really cares and it's useful. If it hasn't been maintained in five years, that's often a pretty good sign, too. Not always true. Example two. Again, I wanted to try to come up with some things that might be more interesting to this group and maybe less interesting to statisticians. So I'm not now going to, um, this is really partly a sales pitch to, for you to maybe consider two packages. One of them is up on CRAN, the other one you actually have to get directly from Simon. Um, Simon's over in New Jersey at uh, AT&T. And so I have some instructions that I've put up that would help you go through the process of doing exactly what we'll be doing here in a second. Um, I don't really maintain the blog, but this is one of the blog entries that's up there. Um, I'm going to do a couple of things right now. I'm actually going to start up the web server here, and I'm also going to start up fast R web. So I'm going to enable my web server to use R for CGI scripting. And this is not done very often, but it's fabulously useful. And I just want to show you an application of using R in a way that most people wouldn't have expected. So let me just do this. Password that can be on the quiz. <laughs> okay, 
So in the background now, we have a process that's waiting and listening for requests. And I can now use R for doing CGI scripting. And so I want to show you the little script that I prepared. There it is. This is actually an R function. It's a function that is called run, but this, this is actually R code. This isn't something that's private. It's a function that takes one argument, possibly more, but it's only using one argument. The default value is 25. I'm going to say hello world because that's a good thing to do when you're introducing the language. I'm declaring that I will be producing a plot that has some pixel dimensions. I'm going to generate some random normal values, generate some others. There's, there's a linear association just sitting here in front of you. Uh, I'll produce a plot, impose a, or, or superimpose a regression line on the plot, um, and then put the results <coughs> into a two column table just using some HTML. Yes? What's that R norm thing? R norm stands for random normal. But what does it do? What does it do? Well, we can have a philosophical discussion on whether there is such thing as a random value. Absolutely. Yeah. But that's not what I'm asking. Um, what does our right? norm do? Our norm uh, returns random normal. OK, so each time you call it, <coughs> well, I'm calling hands it you back a the, value. So okay. if n has the value 25, it'll give me back 25 standard normal values. Uh, zero mean. So they're not all the same? If you call it twice, you get different answers often? Well, you can set a random number seed if you would like the same ones. But I mean, just no two in the series of 25. The first two are probably not equal. I can guarantee you that none of the 25 are equal. Well, there's some chance. It's only fine. There is some chance. Okay. It's getting off in the All right. Basket. No, 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 no. Yeah. No, this is one of the most fascinating things about R I consider. Yeah. It's because it has, and this is in the documentation, it has the various faces of a single object, namely the normally, the normal distribution is both a graph and something like that. You can yeah. pluck things from it. So that's what I, when I said functorial, that's what I meant. Oh, okay, so I think of the, the normal distribution right. having um, a density function or yes. a cumulative distribution function. I'm right. fading out but, again. But that's nothing like about the, the process of plucking. We, we imagine ourselves observing random values from this distribution in a certain way. Right. We could go off and say, well, if I had the inverse of the cumulative distribution function, I could get yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, but, but But they're different things. Most programming languages don't have that explicitly, clearly, et cetera. So the comment is that most programming languages don't have the different faces these aspects of the random distributions. Aspects. We yes. have the normal, we have the uniform, right. we have the exponential. I take it for granted because this well, is uh, you're, you're a, prob a statistician. Uh, but yeah. if that appeals to you, that's Well, weird. but, but, but we, 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 C and Python don't have objects that have the following thing. You press a button and you see the graph of the distribution. You press a different button on the object and you get a variant. No, actually, Python does. You do. Okay, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Take it back. I take it back. I'm going to plow on. So I've uh, started up my. Uh, <laughs> I've started up the process of listening Basically. for requests. I've actually showed you that this is an R function that's sitting out there, and I can actually go and we'll see if that's I can copy view. this over into uh, here. Oh, that's a big deal. <laughs> okay. There it is. So, <laughs> now, if I do this again, okay, I apologize. If, if this is impressive, that's wonderful. I, again, I take it for granted. If I reload this page, I'll get a different 25 points. It's impressive. And then another different 25 points. But the graph of the, the little things in the The graph right? of the, <laughs> the cumulative distribution or the PDF, um, they, that, they, that will always be the same. That will always be the same. Okay. Yep. Um, we can. As with CGI scripts, we can add n equals 1,000, say. That'll be passed through, and now you get 1,000 points rather than 25 points. <laughs> so the R code that I just wrote to do this is basic, basic R code. You know, you want to learn a little bit about R. You can, you can figure out how to write the code that puts that plot up there, superimposes the regression lines, actually does the regression and shows you the results of the regression on the right-hand side, 
maybe if you don't know anything about HTML, the fact that I put this into a two-column table is mysterious, but that's, that misses the point. Um, Simon Urbanek has put a lot of time into some packages out there that actually let you use R for doing CGI scripting. That is amazing. The, he's taking care of security problems. It's widely used at AT&T. has many features that I even haven't begun to explore. So you don't need to be doing statistics or interested in this particular example. But this gives you the ability to quickly develop code and share it maybe with your colleagues because it's useful for them. And you know what? The web interface is actually a pretty slick way to do this. Fabulously useful. So I recently used this for a project. Um, this just went live about two weeks ago. epi.yale.edu, maybe. There we go. So I didn't do the artsy graphics, but I did all the other graphics. We go to the Data Explorer, we can look at country profiles here. This is for different facets of environmental performance. The um, default country is Switzerland, because they were ranked number one in this, this new index. But we actually have um, R serving all this up. Now you might actually say, this is really silly. All you needed to do was produce um, a graphic or two for each of the countries and then just serve up the graphic. Well, yeah, but you might want to customize things, give people uh, you know, the chance to provide options, and based on those options, return something else. So this is actually running live off the Stats Department web server with R producing these graphics on the fly, on request. This happens to be using the grid package for doing graphics. If you're interested in graphics development, you really want to be looking at grid. Base graphics is terrific if you're just doing the standard plots, but if you're doing graphical development, you really want to take a look at grid. It has some fabulous uh, features that really help you do high quality graphics quickly and easily. So you can see here that I even have some bells and whistles. I have a drop down, and instead of this aggregated table, we can get a detailed table with all the different facets of you know, this environmental performance index. And this is all happening live on request playing the CGI script. Um, on the web server is, is actually that. So PNG does making it work for the um, So our search is actually quickly creating a PNG file with a little temporary URL, and that's passed into the web server. It has support for AJAX and JSON and things that I've heard of but don't really understand yet. Yeah. Uh, so in this case, actually, the, the data set the data set underlying this index is static enough that, as I said, maybe we don't really need to be doing this live. Um, we actually have R running, waiting for requests, so the response time is very fast, and it has already loaded up the package containing all of the data going into this. So it's sitting there just waiting. Um, but there's ways that you can be updating this if you're actually doing something that you want to be you know, available in real time. There's ways that you can deal with that as well. Do you have a download source link at the bottom? Do I have a download source or link? Or this uh, data analysis so that we can take a look at your example? No, I don't. Send me an email. I'd be happy to, happy to send this out. It's, uh, the package isn't available yet, so you couldn't actually do it. But if, if you're interested, no problem. Uh, the package by Urbanic is not available oh, yet? Oh, no, no. Simon stuff is available. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Simon stuff is available. It's just that the code that went into producing this particular plot just Okay. Wouldn't do you much good right now. Yeah. Simon stuff completely available. You can, the first example that I did with the little scatter plot and regression results, you, you can do that in 20 minutes if you know what you're doing. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to zip down here unless someone has a different country. There's Switzerland. <laughs> Luxembourg was the request. <laughs> Pilot trend rank of 106. That sounds terrible. Okay, look. Luxembourg is fourth in the overall EPI, and they've probably been doing very well for quite a while. So we have a trend index that's tracking progress. Think about that for a second. If you're already at the top and you've been at the top for a while, you're not improving. <laughs> that's okay. You're fourth in the index. Don't worry about the fact that you're 106th in terms of improvement. The goal here was to try to you know, highlight some of the countries that overall are not performing as well, but have shown some good improvement. Okay, we don't need a lecture on environmental performance right now. Let's get back to business at hand. 
and I said to talk about gambling on college basketball, so I want to do that. And I just want to show you that you can actually go out if you were working along, because some people threatened to. If you go to goldsheet.com, you can actually go, say, to College Hoops, and they have historic logs and ratings. I love every day. And students love talking about things like gambling. So I can look at the, the most recent season they have here, which is 08 09. But this entire webpage actually contains all of the Division I results for men's college basketball in the 2008 2009 season. Are people still hearing me okay? Is this microphone's working? Yep. Yeah. So if you, uh, if you look at this, it actually gives the results of the game. Is it a home game or a visitor game? It's not what you expect. There's wins and losses. And then this column right there, if you read the paragraph up top, actually has the bookies point spreads on the game at tip off. Okay, so this is, this is just a gold mine of information. So I actually want to get this into R and process it. This is data analysis and, and it's a real life question. So I'm actually going to try to do this. Um, I'm actually not sure if we'll scrape this line. I think. 748. I'm going to rely on the slides here rather than actually doing it live. You have the script and you can do this yourself if you'd like. So, uh, back to presentation mode, sorry. Here's, just to give you an idea of what we have, um, Alabama apparently played Yale in late December. Um, let's see, what do we have? The game result 66-63. This section of the code is actually presenting results from the perspective of Alabama. So Alabama won the game 66 to 63. So now we have a little bit of a puzzle because there's an L there. Hmm. Okay, this actually relates back to the point spread. The negative 17 indicates that actually Alabama was favored to win the game by 17 points. I believe that Alabama can play basketball pretty well. And I've spent a lot of time at Yale, and I think it's probably a pretty good estimate. <laughs> Yale, although they lost the game, only lost the game by three points. That is a victory for people from Yale who play basketball. <laughs> uh, this is a fabulous result. And in fact, whether you win or lose is whether you beat the points. That's right. Now, I, I tell you that you're downloading this file by hand. You don't seem to have a problem. Uh, I actually did download this particular file by hand, but I could have put the complete URL right there, and it would work just fine. I wasn't sure if I'd actually have a lot of internet connections, so I didn't want to have to depend on that. Yeah. Okay. So um, Alabama was supposed to win by 17 points. In fact, they only won by three points. Therefore, in this little section, from the perspective of Alabama, Alabama failed to cover the point spread. Okay. Yes. H1 means it was a home game, but I believe it went into one overtime period. Good question. This is serious stuff. There's actually other possibilities over there as well. B, visitor, yeah. What's the prime? We'll figure out who, uh, who really knows their stuff. In fact, I can ask a question right now for wrapping off this book. Okay. I haven't told you the answer to this. So does that make it a fair question or not? But let's wait until it's over. Do I know it? Hold it back. <laughs> well, I'm about to answer the question, so that's good. That's no good. The prime actually stands for a half. I don't know why. Does someone have something against actually saying 15.5? Um, yeah, that's all it means. They don't think their users can handle those fractions. Yeah, what can I say? That's, that's, that's traditional in, in markets. Traditional they, markets. It's traditional the markets. They, they mark them having their own units that are unique to each market. Okay. So this is the gambling it's traditional. Market. Yeah. It's, so I'm it's going to again use some substring to pull off the 43rd character, which I counted, happens to be in that column where the home and visitor thing is, is recorded. And there's actually more possibilities than just home and visitor. Um, there's apparently neutral site games. E, I have no idea. Actually, I have some idea. There's some rows that actually don't have any game results at all, so they're sort of throwaway rows. But things that we might reasonably be interested in would be the main entries of home and visitor games. I'm going to focus just on home games, because otherwise, if you think about it, every game would actually be in the data set twice. And so this is sort of a statsy thing. Uh, if every game is in there twice, then they're not independent observations, and your standard errors will suck. 
So you have to be careful of stuff like that when you're doing statistics. Otherwise, the resulting inference will just be incorrect. So let's only limit our attention to games from the perspective of the home team. And again, I can specify certain columns where I know the actual game results will be. I pull out those substrings. Um, actually, excuse me, this isn't the game result. This is actually the point spread ahead of time. So I take those point spreads. I know that I have to take care of some business. The single quote should really be a 0.5. G sub stands for global substitution. Again, think regular expressions. Take every occurrence of single quote, replace it by a 0.5. If you actually went through, you'd find some P's. P stands for a pick game, where it's predicted to be a tie. P's no good, replace it by a zero. So the left-hand column temp is what we have originally. Temp two is partly clean. Temp, through, temp three is clean, where actually the P has been changed to zero. So that's part of the work. Processing the game results. Again, pick off the right columns. The game scores are separated by a minus sign. We can use exactly the same sort of trick I did just a few minutes ago by working um, through matrices. I guess that's probably on the next slide. But before you do that, make sure you know what you have. This would be an example of something that didn't quite work the first time I tried. So you pull apart things with a minus sign. A good thing to do is check to make sure that they all have exactly the same length. In this case, they don't. There's one example. One example there where when I pull it apart, there must have been no minus sign. Therefore, I just have one thing rather than two things. You actually figure out which of those it is. You can parse that expression when you have a little bit more time. Look at a particular case. And apparently, there was a game involving Lehigh that was postponed. So you see stuff like that in real data. But if you miss it, you can really get yourself into trouble. So always assume that there's a problem with what you do. Clean that up. Everything then has the appropriate length. And at that point, you can use the same sort of trick that I did before by working through a matrix. In this case, it's a two-column matrix. So we have scores for each of the teams in two columns. Convert things to numeric values. Um, and then producing something called game diff, which is the difference between the scores. That's really what's relevant here. We have the bookie's prediction of how close the game will be. And then we actually have the game results. So we want to compare those two things. You can just take a look at some of the cases, make sure you trust what you have um, before going on and actually doing some data analysis. So for instance, you could do a linear model. I generally like to see the plot before the linear model, but since I wanted to put the line on the plot, I did it backwards. So here's a plot. Let's see. It's a line, a linear model. I'm trying to predict the actual difference in scores of the game by using the bookie's point spreads at tip-off time. This model is saying that, well, there's some intercept here of about 0.3, and then the line has slope of 0.98. Okay, that's actually saying that the bookies do a pretty good job. Whatever the bookies predict is a reasonable prediction of what's going to happen in the game. Either that or the results are fudged. Either that or the results are fudged. Yep. And there's plenty of statistics that we can talk about here. I'd love to, but probably not the thing to do at this point in time. I will show you the plot, though. There's a couple of interesting things here. Do a scatter plot like this and look for stuff that surprises you. This is interactive data analysis. Have a conversation with that plot. What do you want to know? Why is that line there? Why is that line there? What's going on here? Someone take a guess. Sorry? We don't have any pick games. Ah, you remember that there were pick games. Pick games letter P. There are some pick games, but frankly, there's not too many. Whatever is happening in the gambling industry, they don't like predicting tie games. So there are a few pick games that are zero, but if you look more closely, you'll actually find that there is never a point spread of exactly plus or minus one half. That's just the way it is. So that's actually creating that vertical thing. There are some zeros, but there's no plus or minus a half. OK, fine. A little bit harder to see, but there's actually a horizontal line at zero as well. Why would that be? <laughs> uh, there's no way to have a tie game. There is no way to have a tie game in basketball. Exactly. So there can't be anything with a y coordinate of zero. Good. Nice plot of points. Looks like it might be a linear association. <coughs> that line looks like it might be a reasonable line. <coughs> That's it. So we can talk more about time gambling and college basketball. But at this point in time, I'd like to not plow ahead with the second part of my talk. I can talk about all of that in probably a half hour, uh, but really? 
So at this point in time, it's getting close to 8, and I should pause for a couple of questions. I'm happy to do either of a few things. Head to the pub, uh, <coughs> talk about some subset of that. I have plenty of takeaway material uh, as well, and I really am not intending to go into too much detail on any one of those. Or, if you really would have more fun doing more interactive data analysis, there's a fabulous data set on Olympic diving where we can look for evidence of nationalistic bias in the judging of Olympic diving. We're in a hurry to leave, by the way. In the least a half hour, we have more time than we needed. So, look, as, I, as I said before, if any of you do have to get up and leave, I understand. Just do it. You are not offending me. This is, this is just fun for me. I don't know if it's fun for you. Change, I'd, I'd like to see, this is just a personal thing, your, your change point analysis. We have one vote for change point analysis. Well, I have a, maybe a quick question and then a slightly more about it. The first one is, uh, the assignment. So, for the R assignment operator, you can use the two character one, which is carrot and then. But it seems like equals works also. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, why do I use less than or minus for doing assignments when you could use a single equal sign just as well? Yes. Absolutely. And I'm going to just back up one slide, two slides, and here is it later. Uh, it's not there. Maybe with a previous example. Um, when I explain that to my students, I say, because I said so. Uh, that's not too satisfactory. You actually have the ability to do assignments as part of other statements. So, for example, I could do, um, instead of doing, instead of fitting this linear model right here as I'm fitting it, I could go to the code that produces this plot. And since I told you I was giving away all this stuff, here's the code for the Beamer file for actually doing that. College basketball point spreads. Yes, yes, yes. Yep. Okay, so I didn't actually do it. But AB line is the command used to put the uh, regression line on this plot. And right here I'm saying uh, put a line on the plot using that linear model result that I previously calculated. I actually could have done something a little bit different right here. I didn't actually need to pre-calculate that. I think I saw it just in a chunk of the red line. Okay, so this is where I fit the model before. But I could have done this. I could have taken this and put it right here. Properly. Okay, so we're on this line of code. Does that make it unreadable if it's highlighted, or is that okay? That's fine. It's fine. Okay. So that one line now, I am superimposing the regression line on the plot. And as I'm doing that, I'm fitting the linear model and assigning the result of the linear model to this object lm.bb. And I'm doing that using the less than minus operator because here I have to. If I wanted to use a single equal sign, I can only use that for standalone assignment because the single equal sign is used for arguments, named arguments of functions. And so in this case, it would be ambiguous. Am I actually trying to use a named argument to the function AB line, or am I doing an assignment? Um, that's the only case I've found where the difference actually mattered. It's a little bit obscure. I really do have a preference for less than minus. I, 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 it's, that's about it. Yeah. Uh, another programming question about four slides before the um, uh, before the plot. About four slides before the plot, you had a for statement, an iteration statement, and I thought one of the um, what, why is that needed if uh, this is a vector language? Ah, right. that's a great question. So the question is, why did I write a for loop? I made a big deal about having vectorized operations. And you know what, there's some cases where um, if you're trying to get a job done quickly without making a mistake, writing a for loop is really not too bad. And if you use a vectorized expression, stuff can go, go wrong. Um, in this particular case, uh, I'm actually working with a list. 
And because I'm working with a list and not a vector, uh, the way you access it can be a little bit dicey. I know that if I'm working with a vector or a matrix, I can do things in certain ways to access subsets that are very reliable and I do it all the time and I know I won't make a mistake. With lists, it's a little bit different. If you're assigning things to a list, you're assigning things to individual components of a list, and there might be expectations that it should be receiving something that's the same size as the thing it already has. It gets a little bit dicey. The first time I went through and tried doing this example, I actually did try doing it as a vector operation, and when it didn't work, my response was, you know, I might be able to figure it out, or I could just write the for loop. And, you know, historically, for loops were really pretty slow in the S language, and even in maybe the early iterations of the R language, they were annoyingly slow. Our computers were annoyingly slow at that point in time. Now, I really don't think it's quite as worth it, and pedagogically, I think that it's nice for a lot of the undergraduates that I'm teaching to be familiar with for loops, even if it doesn't seem ideal. Yeah. So, in, in, in R, so in R you're saying a list is not a one-dimensional vector, it's not a vector of, uh, you know, one by X or whatever. A list, a list is not a vector. They're actually different, and we have to really get under the hood and think about it a little bit. But yeah, I, I don't, I don't quite get that. So I, I did show an example earlier. When you're accessing components of a list, if you use the single bracket, the result of doing a single bracket extraction is also a list. If you use the double bracket for extraction, it is the contents in that position of a list. And I think there might be a constraint that you can't do vectorized assignments to content positions of a list in quite the same way that you can when you're working with vectors. That would be my suspicion. Well, um, a, a list can hold anything. A list can hold anything. So like a list could have a matrix in one position, a vector in another position, and another list in another position. A so list is completely general. That's, that's absolutely right. So you wouldn't apply a vectorized function because the because it's, it's completely functions. unstructured. Yes, yeah. it's, it's completely unstructured. But you might you might try to, but you wouldn't expect it to work. If it's a crazy list. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yes. Let, let me withdraw my suggestion because have, that's a personal desire, <laughs> and it's better to do something else. Okay. Say massive, massive, massive data. Massive data is a secondary request. We have another question here. A withdrawal question. Uh, I have a question about data management. Data management. So if you have multiple sources of data, yep. is there an easy way to do joins and things like stuff, like relational operations? There's a command called merge that does merging of data sets in sensible ways. Um, I, it's a programming language. It's not, you know, it, it's not a suite of functions limited to, to doing certain things. So you envision a problem. You're responsible for coming up with a solution that might include using some convenient tools. But you have access to all these data structures, and you can develop a little algorithm for doing exactly what you're doing. You can construct lots of little matrices and then glue them together into a big matrix. Uh, it's it's unlimited. It's not. Constrained in any way in that respect. There was a question in the back. Sorry, yeah, I was going to actually follow up on that response. You just mentioned okay. that uh, there is, I think it is a creative name like RSQL. So there, there is a package that will let you run basically a load your data frame into like a standalone SQL server running as a sub process or something like that. And then does your SQL command hold back the results. So if you, if you know SQL, you can do it inside R. That's one approach. Yes, R has the ability to interface with a variety of databases. Yeah, is that, that's I, actually right. the, my question is somewhat related. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about a file data source and a URL data source. Yep. Are there like best practices for types of data sources that R works well with? Are there best practices for types? It's not necessarily best practices. That's a bad phrase, but it, it's like, is it does it work best with files or you know like what data sources you know? Uh, so I downloaded or I wanted to study every real estate property record in the city of New Haven. There's about 27,000 of them. If I actually grabbed each of those one at a time from the web, I found that about every 2,000 times or so there would be a hiccup over the web and my 
my code would die. And so I could you know, develop uh, uh, a check to make sure that the result was clean and traffic so the error didn't fill the loop. And you wind up going through a lot to accomplish that. Um, actually, trying to do things live over the web when you're scraping down a huge number of files sometimes isn't the best idea. You might actually be better off just trying to get um, a copy of everything once and then process them locally from your own machine. But that's no different with R from any other language. Um, a file exists someplace. You can access it locally on your machine or out on the web. There might be a slight speed difference, but in terms of best practices, it really doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, I find that comma-separated files are just wildly convenient. It's sometimes not terrible, please excuse me for saying this here, but it's really not terrible to open up a little data set in Excel and just make a, make a quick look at it to make sure that you know, is the first row, for example, variable names or is it real data? Not a bad thing to do. It sounds silly, but you'd be amazed at how often people put together data sets and then put English language that seems nice and descriptive around this data set. It's not part of the data set. It's English text that's meant to be friendly and really gets in the way if you think you have a data set. So I like using CSV files, um, but I, I obviously work with just about anything that I can. Can, uh, can R take advantage of uh, multiple cores, um, try to box, or is that just one of the packages? So it depends on what you mean. It's not, uh, it's not natively multi-threaded. There is a library that's being developed by Luke Tierney out in Iowa that takes advantage of threads for certain types of very mathy operations. I think it's called PNMath. I'm not sure if at this point if it's gotten the main distribution, but it's something that you can get from Luke's site if you're interested in that. I did promise that if people were interested, I could say something about doing parallel computing in R. Um, there's a package called For Each, and a suite of parallel backends that make use of things like MPI, or Snow, if you've heard of it, or Multicore. Um, for doing parallel programming. For each makes use of any of those in a way that winds up being very portable and doesn't impose anyone's idea of the best parallel infrastructure on you. You can use their code with your own parallel backend. I'd be happy to talk about that if that's an example that winds up interesting to you. Yes? Is there a good package for creating maps? Is there a good package for creating maps? What a great question. Okay, I've done some of this. Um, it's not my package, I'm going to sidestep that very briefly. But I have a map here, world.html. Apparently not. World? Yes. OK, there's a map. So this bugged the hell out of me over, um, over Christmas. I wanted to be able to do this, and I couldn't figure out a way to do it. So you have a little mouse over, right? Country highlights, and actually, if I clicked on that, I'd have a hyperlink going elsewhere. It just bugged me that I couldn't figure out how to do this quickly and easily. It was, just seemed like a pain. It turns out I was looking in the wrong place. But what I did to do this, uh, I just went out on the web, did a lot of Googling. I actually wanted to get coastline, um, coastlines for every country in the world. It turns out that if you're really into doing this sort of thing, there's ArcView and ArcInfo and all sorts of these GIS packages that um, all use, I think, a fairly proprietary format for storing these shapes, maybe, or they shape files. And so it was driving me nuts. But I finally found a Python script that let me access those shape files, extract the information, save them then as CSV files, and then load each of the vectors, the segments, into R. So then I have access for all of these outlines in R to produce this map. So then I wrote a little R function that took each of those and actually generated the HTML file and the associated JavaScript needed for the little outlines to work. So there's actually a transparent image for every country here that I generated. So you get the red highlighting. There's JavaScript. It inserts the links in the correct way. I was very proud of myself until I discovered that there's actually a package creatively called Maps. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, is there some controversy here with political boundaries? And I am going to move on. Our call, Microsoft got in a lot of trouble. They came out with Windows 95. And they had a massive backlash. And Microsoft said, well, we're not 
<laughs> I have no recollection. Jerusalem <laughs> West Bank, right? There, there is actually an R package which has boundaries through time, including disputed boundaries. Uh, do you happen to know the name of that package? I, I would have to look it up. Okay. So, <laughs> it could be that it's maps, and I just I have not really explored it that much. Yes. Uh, have you used R Hadoop and MapReduce without? No, I have not personally used uh, Hadoop and MapReduce. Um, it's there, oh boy. Um, <laughs> it's vectorized. Let me, let, me different, let me propose a different terminology here, and that would be split, apply, combine. Yeah. This is not something that I came up with. This yeah. might have been coined by Hadley Wickham, although maybe someone else came up with it. But look, you've got a job to do. You can often split it into smaller parts, apply some function or algorithm to do some analysis on that subset, and then glue it all back together, combine it. That's a very general approach to a wide range of problems. And so a bunch of different people put fancy names on that and they're getting a lot of attention because they've done that. It's nothing more than that. It really isn't. And furthermore, each of those problems that really fall into that category of split, apply, combine are generally painfully parallel, right? And that's what you're doing. Uh, so it's fine, but no, I haven't. What would you say are the biggest problems with R? Biggest problems with R. Um, so R actually uses, uh, so I, I should just say, if I'm going to talk about this, I have a bias because I have worked on this. There's other limitations to R, say threading is a limitation. You can only do threading on certain isolated things. Um, I would say that the biggest limitation of the language is that it uses four byte integers for indexing vectors and therefore matrices, because a matrix is really a vector with a dimensions attribute. So if you think about it, four byte, um, four byte signed integers, you've got a limit of, in the ballpark of two billion things that you can index. That wasn't a big deal five or 10 years ago, but really is starting to be a big deal now. Um, even if you're on a 64-bit platform, it doesn't matter. You cannot use an R vector that has more than two billion elements. So that's a real uh, limitation to the language, and it's also going to be something that's um, next to impossible to fix. You'd actually have to go through a huge amount of code um, to, to address that and to actually recreate the language. Um, and you'd also break a whole bunch of packages in the process. So I don't think that they're probably going to address that directly. Now, I've done some work with a graduate student on um, handling massive matrices. And we actually use the boost meter process library and proper indexing. It, the code is all in C++. Um, there's some other things that you can do, like take advantage of shared memory. So then if you have one of these massive data objects and you're running multiple R processes on the same machine, they can all share access, read and write access to the same massive object. And furthermore, it doesn't even need to be in memory. It's actually using the low level um, M mapping support of the operating system to do file backing. So it doesn't matter how much RAM you have. So on this machine right here, if I had disk space, I could put together a matrix that would be, you know, 100 gigs, 200 gigs, whatever, whatever I could reasonably handle on this machine. It doesn't matter, I've got, you know, whatever, four gigs of RAM. It'll happily work away. I can do things in parallel with shared memory. Um, it sounds great. It's a wonderful data management tool, um, but there's real limitations because this object is not a native R matrix. It's a special matrix that's living in C++. It's still a column major matrix. Um, we actually have a linear algebra library that you can use if you want to do linear algebra, but these objects will not work with all of R's, with most of our standard commands, functions. Um, but it can manage the data set for you, and for this wide range of problems where you're happy extracting subsets, working on a subset, and then looking at the result, it's, it's really very useful. But it's not a, a seamless solution to this problem that R has with um, four byte integer indexing. Yes? Can you give one or two more questions? And one or two more questions, and I have to give away a little. Yes? <laughs> Is there any way to speed it up? Because when I do it on about 
120 different planes, about 130 different planes in one period. If you run the thing and give me a result in maybe three minutes to five minutes, the minute I scale it up to four periods, it's like three days, five days. I don't actually think that's an R question. You're doing optimization. Optimization has been done for a long time, um, often reasonably well. You're generally trying to get to the top of a hill, and that's not something that you can really do in parallel unless you were considering multiple starting points independently because maybe you'll get stuck at a local optimal. Uh, there's people who do applied math and algorithms that are really far better at addressing these sorts of things than I am, but I, I don't think that's really an R specific question. Sorry to sidestep that. Okay, so I'll tell you what, I will do the raffle in just a second, but before I do that, since I didn't formally talk about all these other things that I promised I would, uh, there's a final slide, maybe, that gives you the link that you're going to need to do some of this. Where is it? So there's the linear model, there's college shoots, here's all the stuff that I didn't talk about, but these slides are available, and there's other material that I'll show you in just a second. Not really. So, um, Bayesian change point example in sort of bioinformatics. There's a package, there's a result, there's this theory that you don't want to look at. There's a bunch of references if you care. Um, it's not so bad. Well, okay. it's not so bad. There's an efficient 30 seconds. Um, if you're interested in building packages because you'd like to share the fruits of your research, R has a terrific package manager that's really behind those 3,000 odd packages up on the And that URL, again, it's in the slides, and you can download this at your letter, actually has a description of what you need to do to set up a build environment to handle packages. And that same document actually gives a few examples of the C and C++ interface um, at the most basic level, just a toy example that really shows you what you need to know if you're interested in doing that. Um, sometimes the easiest example can be the most helpful. Um, I gave a very simple example of a package, a couple examples of the C++ interface. There's a loop that's doing something in parallel. Steve Weston is the, um, the guy behind this. He's up in New Haven. For each is the name of the loop. This is going through a couple of integers, doing something in parallel because I set it up to use multi-core on two cores. However, I might choose to use multi-core. Someone else might choose to use RMPI. The only difference is the setup up top. I declared I'm using multi-core. Someone else might declare that you're using uh, RMPI. Someone else might say, I want to do it sequentially. Fine, you can make whatever choice you want. The body of this loop will run regardless on whatever parallel backend that you've declared or haven't declared. So it's very simple, very portable. We actually use it in package BCP. To, uh, to run parallel MCMC for the purpose of speeding stuff up. Mm -hmm. um, very, very useful tool, and Steve Weston deserves a lot of credit uh, for that. And I won't do that. There's lots of people to thank. The other people really at Bell Laboratories that deserve credit for developing the S language originally, uh, Rick Becker and Alan Wilkes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Really, it's the S language that I'm so enthusiastic about. I think it's great that R is open source and we have this big community, but I really do think that the F language fundamentally is the right language for, for doing interactive data analysis. This is what you really need. Um, so in my directory at Yale, capital L-U-G, that probably makes a lot of sense. RPC is a little bit more obscure. That's for R, packages, and C, because I give examples of the C interface in the same document. And if you go to my blog, which really is not active, you'll find uh, lots of information there on using Simon's packages for doing CGI programming in R. Fabulously useful. I, I'm really excited to try some of the more advanced features. So, that is it. And I understand I have to come up with some questions. Yes? Yes. I will turn over to So, actually, I neglected to announce before, we also have um, three vouchers for free ebooks for O'Reilly on DRM and cover ebooks, one for each person who wins. So, we'll need uh, at least four questions. We should do the uh, we should do the three ebooks uh, or the three ebooks first, and then we can do a uh, fourth for the uh, big heavy uh, paper book. And I also wanted to mention that Sean from Alpha One Labs, a hacker space out in Brooklyn, is outside the flyer. If anyone who is interested in finding out more about it can stop by, talk with him, and grab a flyer on the way out. He'll also be stopping by the next uh, 
dialogue hat workshop to talk to anyone there as well. Um, so, uh, Jay, do you want to uh, give your questions in mind? So, how do we do this? I ask a question and what happens? Well, <laughs> you select an answer. I you select a person and uh, see if they can answer. Oh, I select a person and I see if they can answer. No, 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 no. no, no. You, you ask the question. Raise hand. Raise hand. There you go. Right, you're not going to surprise anyone who doesn't know the answer. Okay, well, you guys are in charge here. Uh, I'm just going to take this off. I don't want to land on a slide where there's an answer, right? I guess I can't turn it off. That's a safe slide. Okay. Uh, who made the catch last Sunday? <laughs> I think you're asking the wrong room. The giant. The first hand I saw. Ariel Manning. Yes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> what distribution of Linux did I first use? Oh, lots of people. Ubuntu? Oh. oh. In the back. Debian. Debian is correct. There you go. Is there statistically significant evidence? that would allow us to reject the hypothesis that the gambling market on college basketball is efficient. <laughs> the hypothesis is that it is efficient. Gotcha. Yes. Would it allow us to reject the hypothesis that the market is efficient? So actually go back to no. Yeah, yeah. I, I already called on this job in here, so. Yeah. The answer is no. Okay. You're right. Can you explain why? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's required for this one. I think that's a good yeah, yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's excellent. The standard error here is 0 0.02. There might be a temptation if you're doing hypothesis testing with regression to immediately go to the right column where there's something called a p value. And generally, if you see a number here that's less than 0.05, for very mysterious reasons, that would lead you to uh, reject and say, I have something significant. And that would be correct if you were testing my hypothesis that the true value of the slope was equal to zero. That's actually not what we're testing here. If we have an efficient market, the slope of the relationship would actually be one, right? That the point spread would perfectly, on average, predict the game result. And so the test that we want to do is actually whether or not we think the true coefficient is one. And given the size of that standard error, we would in fact say, you know what? One sounds reasonable. We have no basis for rejecting the efficient market theory. All right. <laughs> nice answer. <laughs> Who yeah, wrote? That was for the book. The book. Who wrote R serve and cast our web? Urbana. What was the first name? James. No. No, not James. I can give the book to someone else, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw this hand next. Huh? Simon. 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 Yeah. Simon. 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 I'll tell you what. You guys can flip a coin for the book. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Would you? I, either of you would you prefer? Uh, all right. It's all yours. Good job. Alright everybody, uh, thank you very much. So actually, we're going to start the Ah! So the uh, the we're going to be going to Flannery's Bar at 205 West 14th Street. That's around 7th Avenue. Why are you here? I am. Thank you. I'm sorry, was the thing you just called on, I believe. So that that can be a uh, am I in or was it? So I, I, I'm sorry. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.